Okay, this is a quick tutorial walking you through the various types of uh, titration analyses to determine the equivalence point uh, of a titration, potentiometric titration. So we're going to use a specific example of alkalinity since we're going to do that uh, frequently in the 241 course, but this would work for any potentiometric titration. I'll also provide you this as a template, uh, but it's important to know how the computations are made so that you can adjust them accordingly and input your own data uh, as you collect it in the class. So the template will look like this. So I typically like to utilize uh, tabs per sample, and I put my sample ID down here. Sometimes I put the date as well if I'm analyzing the same sample several times. Up in the top left corner, you have some generic inputs. Uh, so sample ID, uh, collection analysis date, your specific titrant concentration. This is the standardized version, so this is really important that you know this to at least four significant digits. And then input your sample volume, which is, of course, highly dependent on the sample you're analyzing. This is a constant, this is a molecular weight of calcium carbonate, uh, and this is unique to the alkalinity titration because we're gonna use that value to compute alkalinity later. Uh, and so this video is gonna walk you through four general methods to determine the equivalence point and that's gonna be part of your determination is, is figuring out which method is most precise and most accurate for use going forward. And so the four methods are the simple eye estimate, which is uh, analogous to looking at um, a color change with a indicator, something you would have done in general chemistry. Uh, and then we'll look at the first derivative, the second derivative, uh, and then this thing called a grand plot. And the grand plot is related to this function, the grand function F1, uh, which I just have laid out here, which we will use that function and input that uh, as we compute this column. And so uh, the data that you have, and what I'd recommend in terms of the use of this thing is, of course, you're going to need to replace this data. Uh, and a convenient way to do that is to uh, just make a duplicate of that spreadsheet uh, so that you don't have to input or change the format of your template. So you can just right click, choose move or copy, and then make sure you click this button, create a copy, and then uh, click move to end. And that's just gonna generate a duplicate of that original spreadsheet. You can change the name here, change the values, input your own measured data, and then, uh, and then it will compute everything for you. And so I'm showing you data that uh, is sort of generic collected alkalinity data. So we have what you'd collect in the lab. So you have the volume in terms of milliliters added of the titrant from the burette, and then we have the measured pH or the meter. Uh, and so this is what you would input yourself. Uh, if I make a plot of volume on the x-axis, uh, dependent variable pH on the y-axis, you get the generic, uh, this is a diprotic titration curve. Starting at higher pHs, that's due to the carbonate equilibrium, we reach this first equivalence volume, uh, and then this buffer plateau, and then the second equivalence volume, that's for the bicarbonate to carbonic acid. And so this is the generic alkalinity titration curve that you'll be looking at for samples. Uh, but notice that these inflections, these changes in slope, aren't super obvious. And so if we're gonna eyeball these, there's gonna be certainly some error associated with this. So there's gotta be a variety of ways to extract that. But in general chemistry, you would have either looked at the color change of an indicator or if you collected this potentiometrically, you would have just looked at roughly the halfway point between sort of the flat regions where the slope change occurs the most quickly. So we're calling that the I estimate. Uh, and so to do that really generically and really simply, you can just kind of zoom in on your plot. Uh, for alkalinity titrations, we're really mostly um, interested, at least in terms of comp computing the alkalinity itself, we're looking at the second equivalence volume because whatever we see as the total titrant added at the second equivalence volume, we can assume then there must be uh, sort of two equivalents of, of that um, in the original amount of carbonate. Uh, and we'll talk about that more in class. So what I can do if I wanna eyeball this is say, all right, well, roughly somewhere, this is a flat region, this is a flat region. So halfway between there, it's probably the closest data point is maybe this one. So I can sort of click on it and uh, hover over it, and that gives me uh, the XY points, so 4.80 comma 4.363. And go over to my data here to the 4.80, and I can highlight that red. And that would be the equivalence volume that I would input it as my I estimate, and uh, that's as good as we can do. One note here is that we are conserving the correct number of significant digits in this computation because 
uh, on the burette, we had 4.80. We have three digits that we can extract from the burette, this last digit being the one that we're least certain about, but it's the estimate between the gradation lines. Uh, this data is not captured in the most precise way because typically you want to design your titration such that the equivalence point of interest exceeds 10 milliliters to reach it. Uh, the reason for that is because if we have 10 milliliters here, notice then we've upped our, our significant digits, the ones we know from three to four. And so normally we're shooting for that. This uh, example that I'm showing you only captures three, which means it's, it's not the ideal design for the highest degree of precision. Okay, so the next technique we, we want to employ is the first derivative of our titration plot. So really that's plotting the slope of the original titration curve as a function of volume. Uh, but there's a little bit of nuance here that we have to describe, and that's that um, when we're looking at the slope, which is really just the rise over run, so the change in pH which is rise over change in run, so dPH dV in calculus notation like this, uh, note that if I just sort of arbitrarily grab two points here and uh, make a plot, so chart, uh, and then make a plot here, what I'm seeing here is if I compute the dP dV, dPH dV, which is the change in pH over the change in volume, I'm really determining that between every set of two points. That's what we're doing in a spreadsheet computation of the derivative. And so when we replot the derivative curve, that DPD, DPH dV, that exact slope, is really the slope somewhere in the midpoint of this line, not at each of these individual points, because the line may change after that. And so uh, when we're doing this by a, an Excel spreadsheet method, what we want to do before we compute the, the change in pH over change in volume is actually find the midpoint of these two volume points at every single uh, volume change. And so that's what I have is this third column, Vmid, is the midpoint volume. And uh, that's just simply calculated, if you look at this formula, as uh, the addition of those two points divided by two, which is really just telling you that's halfway between those two points. So that's this point between every set of points, because that's a more accurate representation of the volume at the, at the slope that we're going to compute. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this, and now I'm going to compute this dPH dV parameter. So I'll say equals, and then I'm going to look at my pH, and I'll say uh, the, I'm going to take and subtract um, each data point in sequence, and then divide that by the change in the volume which will be this value subtracted by this value, close the parentheses. And so now we have the change in pH divided by the change in the original volume for each of these points. I can click and hold and drag to compute all the way down to the bottom here. And so what we've essentially computed there is the slope. That's the, the, the change in pH over change in volume, or the rise over run. And to plot this, I'm going to get this out of the way here, I can uh, go to insert, and uh, I'm going to choose a chart here. And I'm actually going to choose the, I'm always going to choose scatter because I want the raw data, but I'm going to connect this with straight lines here just so that we can see uh, the change illustrated more clearly. You never want to just plot the lines because uh, that's disingenuous because you don't know what the actual trend is supposed to be for the data. So I can connect the points, but the points are the most important thing to preserve here. So again, I'm going to go to select data, click add. Now I'm going to choose my x values. In this case, my x, I want to plot against that midpoint, remember, because that's the most accurate volume representation for uh, that slope that we've computed. And then for the y values, I'm going to plot this uh, slope the dPH dV parameter, and then I'll click OK, and then OK, and now I will have produced a plot that looks like this. We never use chart titles in uh, chemistry figures, uh, and then we always add axis titles. So I'm going to write this as dPH dV, and this is our V midpoint volume uh, in milliliters. And so what we see here, if we compare these two plots together, they're over the same x-axis here. And so you notice that the slope change is greatest where we see this inflection. So that's where we see that first equivalence volume uh, right at that point. 
and then the slope flattens out in this buffer region of the titration curve, so that's what we see here, and then it increases pretty rapidly again at the second equivalence volume. And so this becomes our estimate, so now this point, the point collected where we have the greatest change in slope, and so I can hold, hover over that, that gives me 4.750, so I can go down to 4.750 and we get a little bit of a, of a different estimate here, so 4.75. And notice, it's really important here that the, for both of these, the eye, eyeballing or the first derivative, it's really critical that you have maximum numbers of data points where the slope changes the most. And that's always going to be at your equivalence volume because that's the region where you're removing the buffer from the system, where you're approaching uh, the total amount of titrant added to completely neutralize whatever that species is that's in solution. And so there's no buffer region, so you get wild, rapid changes in pH as a function of small volumes of the uh, titrant that's being added. And so if you miss this, if you, if you go too quickly, then you'll end up having a big blank void space within those data points. These ones are pretty, pretty reasonably collected, but if there were a couple in the middle that were absent, then our estimate from the first derivative would not be uh, as nice, nor would our estimate from our uh, eyeballing method. Okay, so on to the second derivative plot. Second derivative is really just the slope change or the derivative of this first derivative plot. Uh, and so what we'd expect is you can see the slope here is negative because it's a, a decreasing uh, and then it switches abruptly to positive. And so if we take the derivative of this plot, which is the second derivative plot, what's nice is we start to see a change from positive to negative values and they will intersect the x-axis, which will give us a little bit more clarity with exactly where these equivalents are. So I'll make that plot. And similarly, uh, just as we've done before to find the midpoint volume, we're gonna do the same thing uh, and find the midpoint between the midpoint volumes. And so I just did that by uh, taking uh, the average, oops, I meant to put this as plus, taking the average of uh, these two points so that gives uh, values that look like this. And for computing the second derivative here, uh, I'm just going to take the difference in my first derivative. So this minus this. And then just like we've done before, now I'm going to uh, use the difference in my midpoint volumes instead of the difference in my uh, volume here. So take this value minus this value close that and drag this down We get these values. Okay, so I can make a similar plot. This is the second derivative plot. Uh, and notice I have second derivative. I just wrote that out for convenience, but really we're plotting the D2PH, DB2 um, uh, as a function of that midpoint volume here. So I can click on this. You can see these data went into making this plot. And notice what we're seeing here again is the slope of this plot. So the change in this plot as a function of that volume. And just as we mentioned before, we see an initial negative slope and then we see this uh, change to a positive slope which corresponds to this inflection point in the first derivative plot. And so where it intercepts that x-axis, that is uh, a good estimate of that first equivalence volume. Similarly, we can do that uh, as this second equivalence volume. One handy thing for these second derivatives is uh, in order to estimate where that uh, intercept is, what I can do is just uh, look at a, a simple plot of the two points that span that x-axis. So if I look here, hold this, I can find that's at the 4.8, 2.4 point. So I can go down here and find the 4.8, 2.4, and I can make that. And then I can look at this point down here and do the same thing. So if I look here, that's 4.7 minus 1.3, and so that's this next point. And one thing I can do is just make a new plot of this uh, straight line here, and I have uh, a plot that looks like this. 
So really all I'm doing are these two points are the same as these two points on exactly the same axis. I'm only plotting those two points. And so I can take these data and I can add a trend line to this uh, or at least squares fit and I can go to more options and what I get is a, a linear trend line between those two points and I can set uh, or display the equation uh, on the chart and what that will tell me is the equation of the line between those two points and what we want to know is an estimate of that intercept and so to do that that's when y equals zero right and so uh, to get that I can either just punch these numbers into a calculator and compute it or what I like to do and what I like to teach in analytical since you, you're really becoming proficient with analysis and spreadsheets is I can just uh, compute the slope and the uh, intercept and the x-intercept directly uh, by using some of the commands here. So I can say equals slope and now I can type in my known y's and x's. So remember my known y's are going to be these two values here. Uh, and then my known x's are going to be these two values and I can close that and that gives me 37 and I can get more sig figs by just expanding this that's exactly 37 and I can do the same thing with the intercept and grab the known y's comma known x's close that and now to get the x-intercept that's when y equals zero so that if we do the algebra and solve uh, for x when y equals zero then that's the same as just dividing the slope into the intercept, the absolute value of that. So I can say equals abs for absolute value. Um, that just gets rid of that negative. And then I can take the intercept, divide by my slope here, close that, and that gives me this value here. So this is our estimate of the equivalence volume from the second derivative plot and then doing a linear uh, or a, a, a least squares fit uh, regression between the two points that span the x-axis to get an estimate of where uh, y equals zero. So I can click on this, I can copy it, I can go up here and then I'm going to go to paste and I'm just going to paste uh, those that value in directly. Uh, this We're not preserving the correct number of significant digits here um, because I'm not reporting this yet. I'm going to use this to compute the alkalinity later and that's what I'll use to, um, uh, to, to compute an uncertainty which will then constrain the number of digits that I actually keep. But for now, for simplicity, I'm just throwing them in there like that. Okay, so, so you can see that we're changing, right? Our initial eyeball was pretty close, 4.8. Uh, our first derivative was uh, slightly less, and our second derivative was uh, slightly less. Now let's do this grand plot method, which is something that um, you, you really haven't probably done before. So the grand plot is based on this grand function, which we're not going to go into great detail in this video, but we may talk about it um, in... Uh, in a classroom setting, but really this comes from a 1980s article where you can pretty simply um, linearize the equation for uh, pH as a function of the volume of the titrant added. Uh, and this all just falls out of the Nernst equation since a potentiometric titration, pH is directly related to the voltage of an electrode. And so you can do some algebra, you can do some simplification, and what you find is that the regions adjacent to the equivalence point uh, uh, at least for uh, a titration where you are titrating a weak base with, or, or a strong base with a strong acid like we are in an alkalinity titration. Uh, when we're just past the equivalence point, uh, we get this linearized form of, of the expression. So we call this the grand function. And the idea is that if you take your titration data and you plot this grand function as well, when the, the, the line becomes straight, uh, it becomes a really nice estimate or proxy for the equivalence volume. And I'll tell you why that's beneficial. But first, let's compute it. So to compute it, uh, all we're going to do is take this first cell under gran, uh, and we're going to type in this equation. So V0, or V sub 0, that's the initial volume of our sample. So that's this 50 mils. So I'm going to say 
50, and then I'm going to click F4 on a keyboard, uh, and all that does is put dollar signs here, and the dollar signs keep that cell fixed, because that's a constant. So when I drag down later, it doesn't also drag down here and give me erroneous numbers. So I'm going to choose add, and now plus V, V being the volume of the titrant that's added. And I'm not going to constrain this value, because I want that to change as I drag that down. I'm going to close that parenthesis, and then I'm going to multiply uh, by 10, and then raise that with a caret symbol, and do pH in parentheses, and I'll do negative uh, pH, and then I'll close that. And this will compute this grand function, or this F1, and I can click and drag this down, and we'll get a bunch of these numbers. So this is the, the, the linearized expression as we're close to the midpoint, uh, or the equivalence point. So let me show you what this plot looks like. So go to insert, and I chose a scatter plot again uh, for x values. I'm going to take the original volume here, not the midpoint volumes, and then I'm going to plot that against this grand function that we just computed. So grab that, I'll click OK, click OK, and we have this plot. This is an error of mine. So we get something that looks like this. Uh, so let me drag this down. We got lots of plots here. So this plot's pretty cool. So what is it telling us? Well, you can kind of see some distinct regions. Let's label this. So uh, we have our, I'll just call this F1. That's our grand function. This is actually in, in units volume. Um, and now we have this as, um, we'll just say volume. And what we see is that uh, we kind of have this flat line here, uh, which corresponds to this region of the titration curve. But as we move past that second equivalence volume, so as we move just past these values, then we start to get this linearized form. And that's because the equation is specifically linearized to the conditions and solution when you have a strong acid titrating a base just past or at the equivalence volume. So the cool part about the grand function and the grand plot is that none of this data up here, none of it matters. So from the initial reading all the way to the equivalence point, none of that is used in the analysis, which means that if you collect really poor data at these equivalence points, doesn't matter. The grand plot doesn't care because it's using the tail out here as a linearized form, this portion, to extrapolate back to the equivalence volume. And it turns out this is the most precise way to compute often, not always, but often, simply because it doesn't rely on that uh, the equilibration challenges of the pH electrode when you have wild swings in pH near the equivalence volume. Because remember, when you're doing this titration, you're adding tiny drops, maybe half, half drops of your titrant, and you're seeing half uh, to maybe even full pH unit changes in your data. That, that's an order of magnitude change in concentration and proton concentration in the solution or hydroxide concentration that your pH electrode needs to respond to. And it can't do that very quickly. And so if you end up going too quickly and the equilibration doesn't, doesn't last, or you just don't collect enough data points in this region, then uh, you know if you're doing this by eyeball or first or second derivative, your data suffers for that, uh, or your your uh, equivalence point determination suffers for that. But for Gran, doesn't matter because it's everything past that second equivalence that we're interested in. So what you want to do for the Gran analysis then is we want to replot this, but we want to plot only the linear section. So how do we know that? Well, you can just uh, look at this by eye, and I can see that probably this data point all the way up through this data point, that looks pretty straight to me. So I'm just going to click this data point, and you'll get pretty good at, at checking this on your own. So that's data point 4.90 uh, in volume. So I'm going to go to here, and I'm actually just going to highlight this whole region and I'm just going to fill this with a with some sort of light color because that's the region, that's all of these straight linearized data points out here that I want to replot. 
and I can just plot them on this same graph. So I can go up to chart design, select data, and I can add another series here. And I'm going to choose now uh, my x values only in the highlighted region, only the ones I determined as linear. And now I'm going to take the grand function as my y, but also only in that linear portion. And so now I have this orange plot, which are identical data points. I've just now parsed them on the plot. So if I click on my uh, plot here, uh, and note I'm, I'm highlighting just the orange because it's pulling up just this set of data. Now I can go and add a trend line uh, to this, uh, choose more options, display equation, and the R squared value on the chart. Okay, so what's this telling me? Well, it's telling me this is the equation of this line. It should be linear because that's by design. That's based on sort of first principles chemistry. And it's telling me how well that uh, least squares regression fits that data with uh, 0.9994 uh, as the R squared value. So that's really good. Typically, you're aiming for above two nines. The other general rule of thumb as you're doing a grand plot analysis in your titration is you want at least five or six data points here, ideally around 10 to, to get a good representation of the behavior out here. So you don't want to do this fit uh, just with a few data points down here. And that's important if we look at where we are in titration space, look at these volumes uh, or look at these pHs, the, the equivalence point was you know by eyeball roughly at a, a pH of 4.3. And so that means um, you could have stopped your titration there if these were your estimates or if these were the way that you were going to determine equivalence volume. But for a grand titration, we want to go significantly past where that equivalence point is in that titration. And so often I suggest going out to around a pH of 3 or, or 3.2, um, really targeting about 5 to 10 points in this linear region of the plot so that you get a good fit and you get a good estimate. So similarly, like I did before, I can compute my uh, slope intercept uh, and the x-intercept. So it's the x-intercept here that will give us an estimate of the equivalence volume. And so I'm going to go ahead and just copy uh, these points down here and I will say equals uh, for my slope. Oops. Um, now I'll choose my known y's and that's my grand function only in the region uh, of linearity and then I'll choose volume as my x uh, and then equals intercept and do the same thing here for known y's and then the known x's. And then, similarly, I can just uh, grab this because the computation is the same for the x-intercept. Uh, it's the absolute value of that uh, intercept divided by the slope. So that gives me 4.711. So I can scroll back up here, paste this in as a value, and now we have uh, an even better estimate of that equivalence volume. And you can see the trend here, where we have sort of an overestimate uh, by I, a slight overestimate by first derivative, we're getting a little bit closer by second, and grand plot we get um, the typically the most precise. Okay, so now you can compute the alkalinity. Um, I'm not going to do that for you because I think that's something that you can determine on your own based on the stoichiometry of the reaction here and the known equivalence volumes that you've computed. Uh, and then, of course, you would want to do this uh, several times so that you could compute an average standard deviation and a relative standard deviation. And these values compared with uh, other classmates' values uh, or known values will allow you to make assertions about uh, things like the precision of each of these analyses, the precision of your uh, experimental method, uh, the accuracy of uh, your method, etc. And I would do that just by taking this trial one data and probably just copying the first few lines so that the uh, equations or formulas are preserved. Go straight over here, paste that in, change this to trial two, and now as I collect volume pH data, I will just 
update these values and then continue them and then just drag my functions because the functions are unchanging uh, for each of these. Make new plots, do my analysis, punch my values in, uh, and I'll be able to, to compute um, for all of these different methods what the alkalinity is, the mean standard deviation, and the relative standard deviation.